Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we're going to discuss the recent visit of what are being called the royals, Prince William and his partner Kate Middleton, who have gone to Jamaica. And their visit has sparked a lot of protests because it, as it happens, the Queen is still the head of state of Jamaica, though Jamaica has been independent for quite some years now. Also, the issue that has come up is that of slavery, because Britain, Great Britain, benefited from slave, not only slave trade, but also production of sugar from Jamaica, conducted by slaves for not a few years, a couple of hundred years. And the wealth of Great Britain, and now United Kingdom, is built a lot on the slave trade and the sugar production, and later slavery and cotton production in the United States, which came to England in that, at that time in the textile industry over there and led to the Industrial Revolution. We have with us Sumangla Damodaran, professor in Ambedkar University, and who has also been looking at the issue of colonialism and its roots in slavery and sugar production and other uh, what would be called the plantation economies there. So, Bangla, if you look at all of this, can you tell us what is the, the anger that we see now in Jamaica? We have saw, seen it in other places as well. Barbados actually got rid of the royalty being the head of state quite some years back. Mm -hmm. What is the reason for this anger? And what is it that the people have said over there vis-a-vis -vis the recent protests that we see in Jamaica? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, so I think uh, the anger is about slavery, of course, and uh, and not just about slavery as um, the way in which slavery is talked about, even when it is acknowledged today as something of the past and something that should not have happened is a little bit embarrassing for Britain and, you know, and uh, the West in general. But the fact that slavery was a very fundamental mode through which these societies were fundamentally exploited, there was a fair amount of expropriation that took place. Um, and uh, of course, what happened to those who were slaves and their descendants uh, later on. So the demand for reparation, therefore, uh, is I think about uh, compensation uh, and to also uh, compensate not only just to pay money for what happened, but also to be able to compensate for the damage that was done over generations. So if we look actually at the demands that have been made by the delegations which have met the royals, uh, uh, it's about educating children, it's about uh, building uh, capabilities uh, of the, you know, of the uh, descendants of slave populations uh, in order to be able to compensate intergenerational transmission of the kind of under underdevelopment that was, you know, wrought by uh, slavery. So, yeah. One of the important things would have been to simply accept or acknowledge mm. that they owe reparations mm. to the descendant of the slaves because they took them out of Africa, huge numbers. Mm. Of course, there is also the question of reparation to Africa. This was really two sets of quote-unquote products, one of slaves being used and the merchants funding slave trade, benefiting from sale and purchase of human beings, mm. and then using them in the plantation. So there are two aspects to it, mm. and what is it called the triangular trade. One funds slavery, uh, slave product, quote unquote slave production, which is capture of human beings, killing a lot of them in the process, transporting them to the West Indies, of course, but also to Brazil mm. and, of course, to United States. Mm. So all of this is one part. Other is the plantation economy, where the slaves are used essentially as factors of production mm. and used to produce sugar, in this particular case, Jamaica being one of the biggest producers of sugar. But also, not only the acknowledgement, but the fact that the wealth of Britain, Great Britain at that time, mm. and today's United Kingdom, is based on the wealth from slave slave trade and for sugar production, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so you're right. So, in terms of uh, just the profits that accrued from these two types of uh, uh, activities, slave trade itself as being highly profitable, and slaves not just being labour for the plantations, but slaves in themselves, you know, producing wealth for slave traders. And then slave owners in turn 
you know, earning wealth as a result of slaves working on the plantations. Uh, the, the amounts of money that this involved uh, and the number of people who were involved as slave owners and slave traders is absolutely staggering. And I think that is the kind of thing that is not publicly acknowledged. It's something in Britain, it's something that is hush-hush. It's a little embarrassing if it has to be acknowledged, but the scale of it is something that is not really acknowledged. So when we look at this demand for reparation, I think it's the scale and uh, of the number of people involved as traders and slave owners. Of course, the more than three million people who were the slaves themselves and the kind of economy that it involved which was also substantial in creating the modern British economy and, I, and also the, the modern imperial economy, uh, colonial economy. Uh, so I think one has to read all that into this demand for reparation. So it's a larger statement on colonialism and the roots of capitalism, uh, which are grounded in slavery. It's a, that's a very interesting point that uh, you are raising. It, it is not just the amount, but also the scale. Mm. And if we look at that, uh, the figures are, I think, that one-fifth of the wealthy British mm. had the roots in slave trade as slave owners or slave traders. That mm. is one-fifth of the uh, wealthy population when slavery was being abolished, which mm. was 1807. And of course, it continued to about 1837 because they said only below six years, six years and below would be freed. Others would be converted into apprentices. So mm. this is really about 240 years or so of slave a enslavement and their use in sugar uh, plantation and other plantations. But uh, when you talk about the scale of reparation, mm -hmm. uh, the reparations, the other in interesting point is slave owners were given reparations, mm -hmm. but the slaves not. And so descendant of the slaves, of course, there's no question of reparation, mm -hmm. but they were not even given, say, okay, you till this land for so many generations, mm -hmm. now this piece of land belongs to you. No, the, land belonged to the plantation owner mm. who was given reparations for having freed the slaves mm. or the state having forced them to free slaves. Mm. But what was the amount of reparations given in terms of money to the slave owners at that time? Because I believe that they were given uh, actually reparations for having, quote unquote, the state having freed the slaves. Yeah. So in Jamaica alone, uh, or, or in, in Britain, uh, uh, I think 46,000 is roughly the number of slave owners who were uh, given uh, a compensation. And today's uh, value terms, it's about more than $16 billion is the estimate. So at uh, that time, it was supposed to be 20 million pounds. Yes. But in today's prices, yes. it's $16.5 billion. billion pounds, 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 actually. Pounds. Yeah. $16.5 yeah. billion. Pounds. pounds. And uh, it is considered the largest bailout in British history. Uh, the other one was what happened uh, with the bailout of banks in 2009. So, so even in that sense, if you look at it, uh, just the very fact that capital is getting compensated, you know, itself is a statement on how important slavery was to the creation of capitalism. So it's interesting, capital was compensated for yeah. having owned slaves yeah. or having traded in slaves, but the slaves themselves, of course, as Prime Minister Cameron, when he went to Jamaica, said, this is, should be forgotten, this is history, you should just move on. Yeah. Though they were compensating the slave owners up to 2015. Yeah. You know, it's a very interesting that you're uh, giving us the facts about uh, the amount, the scale at which it happened. Because there's other case, we of course talk about French Revolution being, you know, uh, the great egalitarian revolution uh, mm. that took place at that time. But the French did not accept that the Haitians mm. should not be slaves. Mm. In fact, Saint Domingo, which was what it was called at the time, mm. Hispaniola, Saint Domingo. So they, when they want to become free, mm. then great Napoleon sends the army, say, no, no, this is not okay. You cannot be uh, free. Mm. That's only for Frenchmen. Yeah. And then they also French impose, along with the British and the Americans, the United States imposes the condition, okay, you can free the slaves, but yeah. you'll have to pay us compensation. And 
Haiti being one of the poorest countries in the world today, a cause of this is the scale at which they paid reparations, which is something like at today's prices, 20 to 30 billion dollars equivalent. So very close to the figures that you talk about in Jamaica. Mm. And they paid it over the next 150 years. Mm. Till 2000, it was, I think, till uh, 1950, they paid the reparations. And of course, French is one of the richest countries in the world. Yeah. Haiti is one of the poorest. Yeah. So this is very similar. Yeah. Yeah. to the issue that reparations are played to save slave owners, yeah. but never to the people who had been uprooted from their place where they were born, lived, uprooted, and then exploited, and generational exploitation of this, uh, of this population. Yeah. So what are the demands that now the Jamaicans have raised? Because I believe there is a 60-point charter which they have, which they have raised vis-a-vis -vis the uh, United Kingdom. Yeah. So I think the uh, fundamental, I mean, there are, there are a lot of different points which are there, which are very detailed. But I think the fundamental point that they are raising over there is that uh, Britain should actually now compensate in terms of contributing to the development of the economy substantially. So in that sense, it's a recognition that it was, it was like we talk about the drain of wealth. Uh, in Indian colonial history that it's slavery as a system apart from the massive human uh, uh, you know atrocities that it that it involved uh, was also fundamentally uh, uh, you know destructive as far as their economic system uh, was concerned and so for, and and which has remained the legacy of it has remained in terms of where um, Jamaica is today in the world so uh, so, so, that, so the demand for reparation, therefore, is, is quite a solid one in terms of, um, you know, rebuilding or, or building um, uh, for, you know, present generations as well and for future generations. So it's not a question of aid, but it's a question of reparations. Yeah, yeah. and it's also not, a, not just an emotional compensation in some sense, you know, that we pay off somebody for the damage that we cause, but it's about, um, it's about a more fundamental historical correction, if that can happen, but at least, you know, in, in so financial terms. What you're terms. saying is not just a question of restitution, yeah. but it's a question of reparations, yeah. which is that you must allow us today yeah. to at least gain some of that which we lost in the becoming, having been uh, converted into slaves and so on. Yeah. Of course, we haven't looked at the, uh, the effect it has on Africa, that maybe we should do it another day. Yeah. But you know, the, if we look at all of this, there is also an Indian angle to it. Because when the slavery is then uh, demolished mm -hmm. in this way, that finally they had to abolish slavery in Jamaica, mm -hmm. the, the, but the slaves walk off the plantation and said, we'll never go to plantations again. Mm. And therefore, Jamaica takes a dip in sugar, has a dip in sugar production. And this Indian endangered labor, which goes to Jamaica for the sugar plantations. Mm. And also Mauritius, where the slavery actually continues for longer, which continues, then becomes a major producer of sugar. And of course, Mauritius also sees indentured labor from mm. India. So the substitution of the slave labor was done by indentured labor, which was a kind of uh, slavery, mm. but not this, maybe not as brutal, or certainly not as brutal uh, as what was done for Africa. Mm. Yeah, so um, uh, the transition to indentured labor very often is also looked at uh, as uh, giving more freedom because supposedly there, were, there was freedom in the contract, but there were other ways. I mean, uh, you know, physical slavery in some sense probably got replaced by penal sanctions, you know, very, very strict sanctions which against misbehavior by workers. So in a certain sense, it was... Um, uh, and there are those who have argued that indenture is very close to slavery. And, and, that, and, and in that sense, uh, this unfreedom of the worker was something, whether it was slavery and then later on indenture and with, with, with labor from India uh, uh, primarily, which uh, produced that only quasi-free labor. It wasn't even quasi-free, it was actually unfree, unfree labor. So, uh, In fact, it's so, very interesting to the way Jamaican uh, Africans who had, you know, West Indian native population who had walked out of the plantation, 
They said, we're never going back there. Mm. And they therefore looked down upon the indentured labor in the West Indies for having replaced them. Yeah. Because they thought, thought in the totem pole, therefore, that's one scale lower yeah. than what they were aspiring to be. Yeah. So that's, that is uh, quite correct to see yeah. that it was as unfree, perhaps, but in a different way yeah. than what was seen as the uh, slave labor in, in Jamaica. Yeah. The last question before we close this discussion, how did it con contribute directly or indirectly to the growth of the Industrial Revolution and the capitalist form of production? Because actually slave production or plantation economy is seen as somewhere in between you know, modern capitalist production and uh, essentially primitive, uh, is, it seemed to be somewhat of a primitive accumulation of capital. Mm. But if you look at the production process of the uh, sugar sugar that takes place, all the lot of the elements of what we would call capitalist production are also visible there, except for the fact it is completely unfree labor. Mm. But apart from that, how would you look at that part of it, that in what way does it help or brings in a new capitalist formation into being. Yeah, so I, uh, the the plantation economy and the way in which it it developed in the Caribbean or in uh, 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 in, in Brazil and so on, which and also labor, Louisiana later in yes, United States. Uh, yes, yes, uh, uh, was really um, uh, a modern uh, enterprise. It was really modern enterprise because it, I mean the the organization of production uh, the uh, you know the precursor to the factory in some sense i mean the in the interesting part over here is that the the people who actually organized the slaves and and got them to produce were known as factors and, and that's the origin of the word factory yes the origin of the word factory most probably comes from from factors factors are somebody who actually organizes uh, gets gets things together so that production can take place and uh, it is under slavery that that kind of production uh, which is akin to capitalist production comes into existence and and the profits out of this plantation uh, economy uh, um, and also the profits from slave trade itself are also then ploughed into the industrial revolution into the railways into finance and back very, to plantations uh, and back to plantations so so in that sense it is uh, it is very much part of the capitalist system and therefore production and reproduction of capital as it were yeah absolutely and um, slavery therefore this this slavery that we are talking about you know whether it's transatlantic slavery and also to some extent i think uh, you know some parts of Indian Ocean slavery uh, by the Portuguese and the Dutch and so on are absolutely modern in terms of the way in which they organize human beings in order to produce. In fact, that's an interesting so, point you're making, though yeah. Taylor is supposed to be the modern uh, founder of industrial uh, management. management. Yeah. But the elements of all of this are more advanced, quote unquote, extracting labor, more labor from the uh, in this case, the slaves, was done in exactly the Taylorist model, mm. well before Taylor comes into yeah. existence. You know, and so this this whole uh, way the organization of production takes place, and even the calculation, how much should you actually let the slave live mm. before he becomes a drag on the slave owner, mm. that was calculated in absolutely capitalist terms, that this much we feed him, this much has to be done, this much has to be, this is his cost of upkeep, yeah. and what does he produce, and when that becomes negative, we can quote unquote dispose him off. Yeah. This is all actually calculated yeah. in very quote unquote capitalist modern terms. Yeah, scientific as well, management techniques. Quote really. unquote scientific yeah. management techniques, yeah. and how to exploit this slave, yeah. what is the maximum extent of exploitation we can do? And in fact, on the cotton uh, plantations, the ex when the textile uh, so-called industrial, not so-called really, industrial revolution takes place and the mills start modernizing in terms of more and more production, the cotton plantations could keep up the growth of the demand that was taking place with only one technology as the book that the half that was never written says mm. that the only technology they had to increase or extract more without increasing the slave population was the bull whip. Mm. So this was the core of the uh, exploitation, the bull whip. But nevertheless, the calculations are all on the basis of what you would call today scientific 
management. It's a yes. very interesting way, yeah. though a very poignant reminder of what the world has gone through and why today we have poor nations and we have rich nations. Yeah. And the fact that what would be called the colonial and settler colonial nations till rule the roost, calling themselves, what is it? The rules, the world, uh, international rule-based world order, yeah. which is really the quote-unquote G7, yeah. in which, of course, Japan is the only not white race, but who have been declared honorary whites. Yeah. Thank you, Sumangla, for being with us and getting us to understand the larger connotation of what slavery meant, particularly in the plantation economy of Jamaica, West Indies, and, of course, the Americas. Thank you. This is all the time we have for this discussion today, so do keep watching News Click and do visit our website.